Wisdom, 
Yeah. <laughs> 
See, I've remembered this morning. I've made Sean proud of me. Before Sean comes up and brings us the word of God, I was sitting there at the piano thinking of this. People's gods may be non-existent to them, or God may be in 10% of their lives, or God can be 50% of their lives, or God can be 100% of people's lives. We all know Kathy, the former Kathy Gifford, the wife of Frank Gifford, the NFL football player, I think. Frank played for the New York Giants, was it, Earl, years ago? And uh, Kathy is an outspoken Christian. She loves the Lord. And she came up with these series called God Weeks. We've talked about them quite often. But I told my oldest brother this week, he rehashed what happened to him on Resurrection Sunday morning. He said, my life will forever be changed. And he just brought it up again and was very emotional about it. I said, Larry, that was a God wink moment. And... Our family can think of a lot of them. Now, I can't answer for other people. I don't live other people's lives. I don't live in your home. I don't, I don't live in your heart. In a way, I hope I do. <laughs> I, I want Jesus to live in your heart. If, I, if I'm there and you have some fond thoughts, that's fine too. But uh, I can sure answer for my family. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. No questions asked. No laws passed. Nothing interfering. God is Lord of our home. I look back over the years. God has given me, you've heard it so many times, my family probably gets tired of hearing it. Four or five miracles. Miracles I'm talking about. Folks, people say, oh, I don't think God does that. Well, then your God is non-existent. He's dead. That's your choice. But it's not my choice. I can remember Holly having beautiful hands as a young girl and on up into her school years and college years. Uh, she had petite, just smooth, beautiful hands. I noticed them about her. But she developed some, uh, I guess we would call them seed warts. They were unsightly. And they was there a long time. 
if I knew what to do, I probably could have done something to clear it up and so on. But in a service, one night I said, Holly, I'm going to take you up front. Some preachers are going to lay their hands on you. They're going to pray for you. So those preachers prayed for Holly's hands. The next week, those seed warts were gone. Pastor, I don't know if I believe you. Well, if you're attending church here, you're going to the wrong church because I must be a lying preacher. We could go on and on. We could go with Crystal, how God has uh, miraculous. So we're not talking about a gradual healing over years' time. I'm talking about instantaneous healings. Uh, Gloria could give you several testimony about God healing her body in an instant. And one Saturday morning, I can remember, you remember the details of these kind of things. I woke up at 3 o'clock on a Saturday morning. The light at the head of the bed was on. And uh, I looked at Gloria, and she was laying there grinning at me. She was very sick all week long. It just drug on and on. She was in misery. I looked at her and I want to say, you goofy nut, what's wrong with you this time of morning? But I said, what's wrong? She said, God just healed me. She put that testimony in words. God touched her body from the top of her head to the sole of her feet. Now, I'm going to choose to believe that and keep going to a God that heals and performs miracles as much as he did 2,000 years ago, as much as God did 6,000 years ago. I'm going to continue to go to this kind of a God and pray and petition God, would you, would you heal me? Would you perform a miracle in my life? And I was just thinking those thoughts sitting at the piano. And I want those watching us this morning and enjoying our service, I want you folks to just be blessed by testimony of how miraculous and how mighty and how loving and caring that our God is. And I, then I'll leave the rest of it to Sean this morning. morning. Richard, I, I just heard loud and clear. Don't mess with my God. He's a good God. And he's a good God all the time. And I do feel that way too. I, um, I've, I've made that note before that I, I'm interested in the field they call apologetics, which is really a, called defense of the gospel. And it's like, well, the gospel doesn't need defending, neither does God. But being with people and acknowledging what the word says and the longer I spend time with God Richard I'm kind of like don't mess with my dad that's not my dad at all evidently you don't know my dad if that's how you're talking about him so I get it I get it he's he's a good God and he always is and always will be and if there are things in this life that you struggle with and that um it's hard to get your arms around and you're kind of trying to figure out or whatever it looks like for you. It's like one thing, rest assured. He always has been. He always will be. He'll always be good, whether we believe it or not. He'll always be good. Somebody need to hear that, Richard. Thank you for bringing that up. I think that need to come out of there somewhere. Somebody needed that. So very good. I, uh, all right, I always have something. This is, all right, this is a good one. I, if I start that way, then Lexi knows it's going to be good, right? Okay, I had done this a while back where it was a, there was a bunch of young people kind of paraphrasing the Bible, and it was a bunch of stuff through the Old Testament. Well, I found one on the New Testament. This was the young, young people, very young people, um, was defining what they think happened in the New Testament era. So after the New Testament, or Old Testament, came the New Testament. Jesus is the star of the show. And this is this is young kids uh, paraphrase of, of what's going on. He was born in Bethlehem in a barn and the young person put I wish I'd been born to barn because my mom is always telling me close the door were you born in a barn and I would say as a matter of fact I was. 
Everybody should be born in a barn. <laughs> During his life, Jesus had many arguments with sinners like the Pharisees and the Democrats. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> Jesus had 12 opossums. And the worst one was Judas Asparagus. Judas was so evil, they named a terrible vegetable after him. That's what it should be. Jesus was a great man. He healed many leopards and even preached to some Germans on the mount. <laughs> but the Democrats and those guys <laughs> put Jesus on trial before Pontius the Pilate. Pilate didn't stick up for Jesus. He just washed his hands instead. Anyway, Jesus died for our sins. Then he came back alive again. He went up to heaven. He'll be back at the end of the aluminum. And his re return is foretold in the book of Revolution. And then one little kid, as one extra note, put in, uh, had his own little prayer to God. Dear God, maybe Cain and Abel wouldn't kill each other so much if they had their own rooms. It works with me and my brother. Love, Larry. <laughs> anyway, uh, kids are great. It's just always my favorite. We just did that discussion on laughter. Laughter is merry heart like medicine. You needed some medicine. Did everybody feel it? Got some medicine in you? Ready to move forward? All right. Well, I did, in this morning's discussion and topic, I did, um, I, I think, I, I've had a, kind of a heavy heart with things that have been going on in our community and others, and this discussion, this uh, topic this morning has been brewing for a bit, but it's interesting, and you'll you kind of follow along, it's always a journey, right, I'm getting into the word, but I want to talk to you this morning about moving forward, not moving on. So... Follow along with me, if you will, in the time we have this morning. But um, I, and this, I think this discussion has its roots in grief. But this this morning discussion doesn't have to be just the loss of a loved one. It's really, and as I as God was taking me deeper in this discussion, it's the loss of anything. And and there's this reality that comes from acknowledging. None of us were equipped to handle loss very well, were we? I mean, I can take you to the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. What was that whole thing about? Jesus' own acknowledgement of what loss does to us and, and the accompanying emotion that we uh, experience, we refer to as grief. And again, it, it's easiest, and I think we always bring that out as a, we've lost a loved one. But anything you lo lose that is dear to you, can we go through a period of grieving where we're trying to acknowledge and trying to find a way forward, not necessarily move on like so many say. And I want to touch on that one too because it, isn't that amazing? And especially now I will take you to the topic of uh, and having lost someone dear to me in this life, I understand what that means, that gnawing grief that doesn't want to go away. And people try to do their best. They try to be nice. And they'll make comments like this. Isn't it time you moved on? You'll move on eventually. They think that's helping. They think that's helping. I'm glad to see you've moved on. And those that have been through gut-wrenching, gnawing grief understand. It's like, stop talking. <laughs> and, and I don't mean to be, you don't mean to be mean or, or not acknowledge the, the sentiment somebody's trying to bring about. And I actually had a note um, here. I'm going to get into many of these things, I guess. Um, losing a pet or losing anything that is so dear to you that it's been like a close personal friend, it's the same thing we experience. We experience grief at the loss of something. Something's there. It was part of us, and now it's not, at least in this present state. And there's nothing you can do about it. And it's, it's that loss, that separation, and that... Lack of ability to do anything. Does everybody understand what I'm feeling? This is exactly how it felt for me. It's like that loss that you can't do anything about. And you just, this, the accompanying emotion that sets in is grief. It's what do I do with myself? How do I move forward? And we're going to, I want to talk about that. I want to focus on that this morning because regardless of our situation, regardless of how people want to paint the picture for you, haven't you moved on? I've moved on. So shouldn't you, whatever that looks like, and it's different for every single one of us in order to acknowledge that. So that connotation, I, I like this phrase. Many people, there's so much knowledge out there on this, and definitely I want to go very specifically, Becky, to 
What would I ask you if I was going to ask you? I might ask what the Bible says because I have a feeling God's got some wisdom beyond all of our years to help us through these struggles. Everything we go through is common to man or woman. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Every one of us, the struggles we go through, we said this on Sunday night, and I'll bring it up here for Sunday morning, especially for those out there. I hope this helps someone in acknowledging. We may think sometimes we're the only one that's ever been through because you internalize what you're going through. But the reality is, at some point in time, somebody is starting this issue, maybe like you. Some people are halfway through this issue. Some people are three-fourths of the way through this issue. Some people are past this issue. And some people are looking at this issue in their rearview mirror. And it's been years from now. At any given time, take heart in acknowledging you're not alone, ever. Don't ever let the enemy trap you into thinking this, the solitude sometimes we put on ourselves in order to cope and deal is actually a construct of the enemy trying to almost take us off by ourselves like we pray from the herd and it loses the protection. And we've got to acknowledge we're stronger together and we can find that strength together to move forward, if not on. So I like this phrase that talking about grieving and grief in general. While people who haven't experienced grief, they like to think of it as an endpoint. Like, go to here, and then it's better. Like, that's when it's okay. But if you haven't experienced that for yourself, you don't understand it the same way. I, I like this phrase. Grief doesn't come with a timeline. Grief doesn't come with a timeline. Like, like many might assume. Because moving on suggests you're past some tripping point, some trigger. And, and I think many people might internalize, well, I don't feel like I've moved on, so maybe there's something wrong with me. And the point is, there's nothing wrong with any of us. The, the thought of acknowledging the loss is what creates that sense of despair, grief, and can turn into full-on depression if we allow. Because what? Because we don't understand what it is I'm supposed to do, which is move forward. Forward motion is what keeps us going on this journey. It keeps us traveling down the path. It's when we stop is when we quit making forward motion. And I want to bring, I want to bring you why the word is very filled with the discussion to help us through that situation. So I, I did, I have, a, I have a little bit of blurb that I do want to share with you. I think is so great that um, I found this lady. Her name is Nora McInerney best pronunciation. She gave a TED talk on this back in 18. If you want to Google her, she's wonderful. There's a lengthy discussion. I just want to bring a couple excerpts from her. She went through, and, and you might say, you know, we talked, we've been talking in like Sunday night when we were talking about what's the antidote to many of the things we struggle with, counting your blessings. And it's very simplistic to say that, but you would be surprised at how healing and therapeutic it is to acknowledge what Richard just said. God winks the moments where I know I'm blessed in the face of the despair or difficulty I'm facing. Somehow it brings, it sheds different light. It might give you a different perspective on the situation you happen to be in. But the woman I'm talking about, if you want to put yourself in her shoes, have some empathy for someone else, you might think, well, I'm already going through something difficult, Sean. Why would I do that? Well, how'd you like to have this? In a very short term time frame, she lost a child. I won't go into the details. You can hear her story. Then she lost her father. Then she lost her husband in a few months. So you think, okay, it's really bad, Sean. You don't understand what's going on with me. Well, Nora would probably tell you, how'd you like to go through that instead? And I'm not trying to make light. That's not the point. But many times if we acknowledge and we think about walking the earth in someone else's shoes, it's when, well, here's the lot I've been handed. How do I compare to someone else? How would I handle what they're going through? Have you ever done that? God's been doing that with me a lot lately. I don't know, not that I ever didn't have empathy, but lately I've caught myself thinking through a situation and thinking of someone that's on my heart, and I put myself, I want to put myself in their body like Freaky Friday and think, what would it be like to live life in their shoes and behind their eyes and acknowledge that? And it changes you to do that because it allows you to see the world with a different set of perspective. And then do this. Now put yourself in the Holy One's eyes. And then that prayer becomes more, more real to you. Give me your eyes, Lord. Give me, give me your viewpoint and vision and perspective. Because it will change your life. And especially it does that for others. But this uh, Mrs. McInerney, um, 
she talked a lot about this, and she said she acknowledges a number of things that how we can feel frozen in our grief many times. And, and then she even gave a really interesting model, and I have a picture, and I was going to share it, but I can just verbally describe it pretty quickly. She had a, a big ball inside a jar, and it took up most of the jar. And you think about that being your grief. Most people think your grief shrinks, so after a while, the grief looks much smaller compared to the vessel. Let's see, think of us as the vessel and the grief within us. So we think that's what happens, but in reality, what happens? The jar gets bigger, but the grief doesn't always get smaller for us. After years, many times, the grief, if we allow ourselves, it still feels just as, the loss feels just as powerful as it did then, as it may, maybe it does years now. But what's changed? I've got a bigger vessel to handle more of what life has thrown my way. I've got more of the fortitude and what Paul talked about, that, that gumption. We don't use words like that anymore. I love words from the 40s like that. Lexi and I talk about this gumption. We need some more gumption to be able to acknowledge who God is in the midst of our situation to handle and say, we'll be realistic about the fact that the grief may still be it may still be there. It's not necessarily gone. I don't want to take, I don't want to make false pretense here. But the point is, my vessel has enlarged. God has enlarged my borders. God has allowed me more capacity than I ever thought was able by putting my trust in him. What does that mean when I put myself in him? When God before me, who can be against me? What does that really mean? There's an acknowledgement in that that, it, that says I recognize his power, his strength, his ability, his omnipotence in all things. And what that means for me is he is more than able in the midst of my difficulty. I might think it's overwhelming, but he and I are a majority. And we look at problems differently when we're together. Problems don't look as big when we're able to lock arms with something stronger than us. It gives you a renewed found sense of not just purpose, but strength and energy like well, bring it on. There's two of us. <laughs> it doesn't look very... You may think I'm something. David did the same thing when he stared down Goliath. He acknowledged it in his words. Go back and read David's words again. Who is this in the face? Who dare, how does he dare defy the armies of the living God? His acknowledgement was, oh, you don't know my dad. <laughs> you just picked a fight with the wrong kid on the school grounds. You don't know my dad. That was the point of that acknowledgement. It doesn't make light of the grief we suffer, the things we experience. And uh, oh, there goes that. I, uh, okay, I, I want to make sure I didn't miss a note. So let me read a little bit of um, uh, Nora's excerpt. And I, I really like this. So I'm going to read just it's some of her words. I just, I'm giving her credit for it. By any measure, life is really good, really, really good. But she says, I haven't moved on. I haven't moved on. I hate that phrase so much, <laughs> she said. I understand why other people do, because what it says, that her husband's name was Aaron. It says that Aaron's life and death and love are just moments I can leave behind me. And that I probably should, somehow, in order to move on. And, but, and when I talk about Aaron, I slip so easily into the present tense. I've always thought that made me weird. And then I noticed... Everybody does it. Because here's the thing. It's not because we're in denial or because we're forgetful. It's because the people we love, who we've lost, this could be anything you've lost. And I'm going to touch on that in just a minute. The people we've lost are still so present with us. And so when I say, oh, Aaron is, it's because Aaron still is. And it's not in the way that he was before, which was better. It's not in the way that churchy people try to tell me he would be. It's just that he's indelible. He is so present for me and with me. He's present with me in everything I do, in my children we had together, in the ch other children I'm raising who have never met him now. She, she got remarried and she had new, new family, new children from the other relationships she brought in. I'm raising people who have never met him who share none of his DNA, but they are only in my life because I had Aaron and because I lost Aaron. It's powerful. The times we live in this life and the journey we go down, all appointed of God. God's not the bad guy because of the issues that befall us. God is part of the beautiful melody and instrument that is continued to make through our lives. 
the journey we continue on, the difficulties we face, the stumbling blocks that we turn into stepping stones are still part of this beautiful journey that God's a part of every single day. Give us this day our daily bread. So she just finishes with, because Aaron's love, life, and death may be the person that her new husband wanted to marry, I'm not moved on from Aaron. I'm moving forward with him. So, so again, I'm, I'm, I'm captivated by this discussion because I understand what that's like now. Losing our brother when we were young, like, I remember that raw, aching uh, feeling like, this isn't supposed to be. You don't lose your brother when you're in your 20s. No way. You're supposed to, I don't know, I, somehow I think we feel like there's an <laughs> unwritten contract that we are guaranteed 80, 90, 100 years, every one of us, and our loved ones. And if you hear about something happening to someone else, it's easy to acknowledge, that's sad, I feel for you. And it's the same thing now. It should change how we approach people at funerals, right? It shouldn't be, I feel bad for you. I'm tr you're trying to express sentiment, but let me just give you a, a, a little clue or a help, if I can. If you haven't experienced that true gnawing grief for yourself, what's the b single best thing you can do for someone that is grieving? Just show up and hug them. You don't need words every time. Many times, the non-words are the best words. Everybody agree with me on that? Sometimes the I'm here and I'm not going anywhere is the best thing you can say, and you don't have to say it. <laughs> I'm just trying to help somebody out here with this. But, and, and I, can, I, I had acknowledged some of the stages of grieving because as I go through this kind of difficulty and these challenges, we both know there are so many things um, actually, I do. I am going to take a step. I want to go back to this point because when I talk about grieving, I can talk about the loss of a loved one, and I think that hits us more deeply. But anything we lose that we had held convictions onto feels the same way. It's the same sense of grief. And I had I starting to write notes. Many times, it's the loss of opportunity. You could say a loss of a job or a career or a direction or a dream. People will go through the same kind of grieving process when they feel like they've lost what was supposed to be theirs. We can lose a pet. A pet can be so dear and get us through so many tough times that losing them feels like a part of you's gone. And I, I get that. It's the same experience, the same emotion. It's grieving. I've got, we've got close family. Losing a limb. Can, and there's that wonderful movie Soul Surfer that gives an inside perspective on someone losing a limb and feeling the grief and the sorrow over loss of what's not going to happen now. What have I lost? What am I? But the point is, everything we go through that's a difficulty, that's a stumbling block, that we can turn into a stepping stone, that could have been my title too, is an opportunity to gain an insight and perspective we may have never had had we not went through that. Think about that for a moment. And this is an honest question, a rhetorical question I would pose and say, if you know where you've been now, where God has brought you, and the lives you've touched since you went through something terribly difficult, would you not go through it if you had the chance? You might say, oh, Sean. <laughs> when, I, when I got in that gym, I don't remember what year that was, early 2000s, and I got in there thinking I was tough as nails and I was going to bench press after not having had taken a hiatus off, I would have rather not done it that day rather than tear my chest muscle and go through surgery and rehab and all those terrible things I had to go through. But here's another question for you. If I could go back and wake up Sean in early 2000s that morning before I went into the gym, could I stop myself? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. Could I not make the decision that caused me pain and difficulty and I had to, but it, yet going through that difficulty and experience and trial also made me more resolved and stronger maybe than I thought I was. Because here's the other reality. You may think you're not strong, but the reality is if you look back, you're already strong. Look what you've already been through. Look what you've already been through. Look where you are. Okay, I would use that phrase too. I could tell this for my girls because we went to Colorado for the first time a few years ago and we did a hiking trip and I might have made a mistake on how much elevation gain was in the little app. And I said, we can do it, guys. And everybody's like, yeah. And we start climbing and climbing and climbing. And we are going up, up, up. And pretty soon they're like, Dad, this is awful. 
this is not fun. <laughs> and I'm like, but guys, look, you know, we're going toward the top, and there's this beautiful pond up there supposed to be, and all this wonderful, like, let's go, we can make it. And then we go up, and, okay, I realized we gained, like, I don't know, 2,000 feet of elevation or something. I don't know, it was ridiculous. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's what that number was on the app. Oh, that was elevation gain. Oh, sorry, guys. And the pond at the top was kind of like a puddle. <laughs> It wasn't much of a bond, but, and I don't know if they agree with me yet or not. Now we laugh about it. But when you got to the top, you know what was amazing? Everybody had to acknowledge this. You had to at least give me this. Looking back at how far we had come, I just did that. All of us could say that. And going downhill was a lot easier than going up, I'll just say. But if you look back at where you've come from, that's the count your blessings exercise I'm discussing. It's the God wink moment that Richard was talking about. If you go back and think about the goodness of God. Sean likes, I love to sing that song. That's a good, that's a good one. He does in praise. I think of the goodness of God. Dwell on the goodness of God. And use that to have perspective on the situation we're in the middle of. Because, frankly, if you look at things and gain some perspective. I'm actually thinking of a scene I like this scene. I love movie scenes. But in that Soul Surfer movie, I think Carrie, uh, could be singing. Uh, yeah, I remember. Was uh, the actor in that movie. And I loved her scene she was like the youth leader. And she showed this picture up close. And it was like, I can't tell what that is. But you zoom out and it was like, oh. It's like sometimes when we're, we're too close, and we, gotta, we can't see the forest for the trees. We got to zoom out a bit. You ever done that on uh, something on the computer? And you're like, oh, zoom out. Oh, okay, now I see. Like, oh, when I was so far in, I didn't see. And sometimes when you're really close to the situation and you're the one embedded in it and the grief is so real to you, sometimes we've got to, zooming out means putting God first things first and allowing him some perspective to work in our lives and maybe counting our blessings along the way. So I had a note about, um, you know, I, I can acknowledge the stages of grief and it, we all tend to go through things. We start, we first start with denying we're like, no, this didn't happen. And then maybe then it's just anger. Lexi was talking about anger in Sunday school and several were. Yeah, then it's just like anger at the situation, at God, at whatever. It's just a way to get rid of and process the angst. And that's okay. And sometimes, but maybe that's part of the moving forward. Get it out of your system. I would definitely say don't bottle it up. I remember people telling me as a young kid, I'd get all quiet about stuff. And... Maybe I'm, I hope I'm better than now. <laughs> but I remember them saying this comment, you better not bottle that emotion up or it's going to explode one of these days. And we can see that in people's lives and other. And especially now and coming through the pandemic and things that people are struggling with, it's like we've got to process what's in front of us, whatever it is, good or bad, because we've got to move forward. I'm not saying moving on. That issue may not be gone. It doesn't, it, it's okay. It's okay. We're moving forward regardless. Then we go into bargaining. That's where we're trying to make, well, what if this and that and whatever. And that doesn't get you anywhere either other than going through the exercise. It can end up in depression. Actually just loss of sleep and appetite and all those other things that come from that feeling of hopelessness. But ultimately, it goes through a period of acceptance. That's what they all say. We finally come to grips with it in some way, shape, or form. But that's the point, and that's one of the keys to moving forward is we're not saying it's gone. We're not saying that it's all, um, it's not worth it, or the, the, the loss I felt is not worth what I invested in it. It's not. The point is, as we move down this road, as we journey forward together, the point is, there is so much beauty yet to experience and perceive. There's so much. If there's time left, I, I kind of look at it this way. I look at it like this. If God gave me breath this morning, then he's got something today for me to do. It's not a throwaway day. It's not a waste your time. I got to kill some time. I, we've had that discussion. I brought that message here months back. There, I feel very strongly, and I, I would argue emphatically for every one of you, if you woke up this morning with life and breath, I think you all did. You're still with me? Okay, good, good. All right, that I perceive we've been deputized and we've got a job to do. So let's get busy because there's something yet. It may not be just for you. It may be for your neighbor. 
or your friend or your relative or I don't know who, but God deputized you because he gave you breath. You already got license to activate and move forward. You already have that ability to do that. So what are some things that we can do? Um, let, me, let me take you back. I'm, I do this a lot where I bring up, I want to go right to this. I think I go through my notes and I'm mentally thinking through. But So when we think about these things and the former life, those, the, the misery sometimes that comes about, I wanted to give you some, some from the word to help us out. Moses in Exodus 14 and 13, way early. Moses said, fear not, stand firm, firm, confident, undismayed. And see what the salvation of the Lord, will he, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians you have seen today, you shall never see again. Whoa, that is a strong set of words that he was coming about. And this is from the guy that was like, mm, God, don't use me. I stutter and I don't have good speech. <laughs> Hard pass. You need to pick someone else. And God's like, no, you're the guy. And I'm saying to you today, you're the person because you woke up with breath. So there's something yet for you to do, whatever that looks like. So in the midst of that, I like that phrase. Stand still, firm, confident, undismayed. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. What was he saying in that situation? God speaking right through Moses to the chosen people. And let me say something about them and the, the fear and the things they were struggling with. They had been brought out of bondage. They were suffering. They were grieving over what they just lost. And you're like, well, they were in bondage. Just grow up, people. Move on, Israel. <laughs> right? We might say to them after reading the children of Israel, they were in slavery. They were being beaten. They were, they were in terrible bondage. But yet they get to the Red Sea and they're like, why, God? I mean, does this sound like all of us? We got an example in the Bible of the, how this worked out. You brought me all this way and you're going to kill me here at the Red Sea? Why did you do this to me, God? And God, through Moses, says, stand still. That wasn't a quit your yapping. It was just watch and wait. I am right here and I've never left you. I've been beside you the whole time. Watch the salvation of God. Watch your problems melt away. And maybe the things that we feel like are, um, are grief and others that I'm talking about, if it doesn't go away completely, it's okay. Because the vessel will be enlarged. God will allow whatever we go through in the, at our acknowledgement with him's, him is going to keep us going forward. Isaiah 43 and 18 to 19 says this. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. And then, of course, Paul's got these great verses. Philippians 3 and 12 to 14. Now, not that I have already attained. I love Paul. He was always kind of meter his discussion. Or I'm already perfected. I'm not all the way there. I have not figured out everything I need. I don't have everything solved in my own life. I don't have everything figured out. But I press on. I'm moving forward. I may, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, not forgetting our loved ones, but acknowledging the perspective of where they are in spite of where I'm moving to. I'm reaching forward to those things which are ahead, pressing toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The point is, we can take those people, those loved ones, and all the hurt that we experienced, that we grieved over, it goes with us. It's part of our journey. It propels us. Allow it to propel us instead of holding us back in a seat of do nothing and stuck. I know, Chris, this is one he likes. Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the thoughts I, I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. That's a great one. How about Job? One example from somebody that went through something tough? Read Job again if you haven't done that recently. That's your homework lesson for the week. Job, the righteous keep moving forward and those with clean hands become stronger and stronger. Not just, don't use a hand sanitizer. <laughs> that wasn't the point. I can get into a little more depth there. But how about this, Romans and 8. There is therefore no condemnation to those which are in Christ Jesus who, what? 
Walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. What's that mean? There's going to be an acknowledgement of what he does through us is going to be by his strength walking through us. And that's, to me, that's comforting. You know why that's comforting? Because it doesn't have to be me always propped up and thinking I'm strong enough to handle everything in life. It gives me great comfort to know his strength. I'm made perfect in my weakness. I'm made perfect in his strength. I don't have to be strong enough for everything because I rest on the one that has the arms that is strong enough. That's the, the surrender. I think that's another thing, and I, I could do a whole discussion on surrender, but I think in our Christian walk, many times, we look at difficulty and we think surrender means I'm not doing enough to make thing to fix my situation. And God's point all along is you're supposed to be strong in me. That's how you're strongest. That's how you supernaturally can look at your problems and say, Goliath may look big, but he is not covenant. <laughs> he hasn't seen my dad. And you might think, oh, I want to get to that point, Sean. I want to get to the point where I look at my stumbling blocks and I immediately see stepping stones. Sometimes we don't immediately. Sometimes it takes time, and sometimes it takes a while to have our vessel enlarged to where the grief is much smaller compared to the vessel. It's not that the grief went away, that it's small, that it's gone, that we moved on. It's just ultimately in this life, I don't have to be frozen in fear anymore. Fear's a liar. That acknowledgement that fear and the things that accompany it are just part of the thing that the enemy is using to hold you in quicksand and not allow you to move forward. But the truth of the reality is that if I can turn my eyes on him, Hebrews 12, 1 says, I can then run with endurance the race that's set before me by what? Fixing, looking to the one that's the author and finisher of my faith, perfecter of my faith. I like that. Pray with me then this morning. Lord, I just thank you for your goodness, your blessings. Lord, Lord, it's a, it is it's frustrating to us in our human condition, but you get it. You walked among us. You hear and experience things just like we do. You wept over the loss and grief, and, and you acknowledge what that means and that feels. And we, frankly, we aren't, we aren't equipped to handle grief <laughs> and loss in so many ways. It doesn't, it's not just a loved one that could be very dear and close. It could be a loss of dreams and perspective and ideals and position and uh, limbs and anything else in life that we feel like we've, we've lost and fallen backwards from where we should be. Lord, you are good enough and able to keep us moving forward in you because we acknowledge that it's within your strength. Our strength is made perfect in weakness because you work in that and show us the way where there seems to be no way. We love you, Lord. This morning we're going to give you all the praise and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.